Can I welcome everyone to the 33rd meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? Apologies have been received from Oliver Mundell. Uh, Michelle Ballantyne will substitute today for Oliver. Welcome again, Michelle. The first item of business is a decision on whether to take agenda items three and four in private. And is everyone content that agenda items three and four be taken in private? Thank you. The next item of business is the draft budget for 2018-19. And today we hear from the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills and Government Officials. And can I welcome John Swinney, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills, Aileen McKechnie, Director for Advanced Learning and Science, and Michael Chalmers, Director for Children, Director Children and Families in the Scottish Government. Thank you for coming along today. And I understand, Cabinet Secretary, you'd like to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you, Kavir, for the opportunity to make an opening statement on the 2018-19 draft budget. Despite the ever-challenging approach that the United, government, United Kingdom government take to public spending, education spending remains a top priority of this government. The draft budget we've delivered ensures that the focus remains on this commitment. We will provide £243 million in funding to support the near doubling of funded early learning and childcare. To support the next phase of ELC progress towards 2020, we're providing an additional £54.3 million in revenue, which will be predominantly used to support the expansion in the workforce and the upskilling of the existing early learning and childcare workforce, and £150 million in capital funding to support the next phase of infrastructure investment. £52.2 million of the additional revenue in 2018-19 will be allocated to local authorities and all of the £150 million of capital will be allocated uh, to local authorities. We are working to close the attainment gap through increased targeted investment in schools and this budget will allocate £179 million to the Scottish Attainment <laughs> Fund, including £120 million in pupil equity funding to be spent at the discretion of head teachers on closing the attainment gap with over 2,300 schools receiving pupil equity funding. We will continue to push ahead with our education reforms, with £4 million allocated in 2018-19 to empower our teachers, parents and communities to deliver excellence and equity for our children. And we will also deliver funding to support the range of work across the breadth of curriculum for excellence. Um, in the next financial year, we will continue to protect the principle of free tuition and widening access to university for young people from the most deprived communities. This is an overall real terms increase in the higher education budget of 1.9% uh, when resource, capital and financial transactions are combined. This very positive settlement will allow us to provide a cash terms increase for uh, teaching support and maintain world leading research innovation in our universities whilst ensuring further progress and widening access. We will continue to ensure that access to universities should be based on the ability to learn, not the ability to pay. And to support this, we've invested over a billion pounds per year in higher education since 2012-13, and this currently includes 51 million pounds a year to support approximately 7,000 places for access students and those progressing from college. We will increase investment in our colleges, helping them to improve the life chances of our citizens and generate the skilled workforce needed for economic growth. To achieve this, we will increase overall college funding, resource and capital by 66.2 million to 664.9 million pounds an increase of 9.4 per cent over the year. We have increased investment to provide additional funding to support harmonisation of pay and terms and conditions across the sector, and college capital funding will increase by £29.3 million pounds, uh, compared to 2017-18. Skills Development Scotland will receive an additional £13.7 million pounds in 2018-19 to further expand modern apprenticeship starts to, to 30000 a year by 2020, which will include new graduate level opportunities. And I look forward to addressing the committee's Very questions. Much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, before I invite questions from members of the committee, I'd like to start the questions by asking you about additional support for learning. The 2018 19 budget makes a commitment to continue to implement the Doran Review through £10 million in funding for organisations that provide support for children and young people with additional support needs. Could you tell the committee what specific outcomes you intend to achieve with this funding? And how will it be evaluated to ensure value for money is delivered? Um, what we need to ensure is uh, uh, the commitment that is implicit in legislation that the needs of all young people are met by the education system is a crucial uh, test of the effective utilisation of the resources that you have raised, convener. And what the government does in partnership with our uh, with the various institutions that provide the support directly through the uh, under the auspices of the the Doran review 
um, is focus on ensuring that young people are able to fulfil their potential within the education system. And uh, that is assessed by the a whole variety of different uh, considerations. Some of it will be around um, the achievement of CFE levels. <coughs> Others will be about ensuring the strengthening of capacities of young people where those uh, capacities can be particularly enhanced by their interaction with the education system. Um, but fundamentally, um, we are looking to ensure that that test of ensuring the, f the potential of every child is fulfilled um, will be the test that's applied to the utilisation of those resources. Can I, can I ask, uh, thank you for that response, but the Scottish Children's Service Coalition said that there must be clearer guidance from the Scottish Government to local authorities to ensure consistent and meaningful identification and recording of children and people with uh, ASN. Uh, because of the significant variation in local authorities and the number of people that's identified. What sort of work has been done to make sure that there's, there's that level of recording being done? The, the, obviously, there's been a significant change in the level of recording of young people with additional support needs over the course of the last um, six years or so. Um, and that has been as a consequence of guidance that has been put in place, um, driven by legislative change, and to ensure that the needs of young people are more effectively identified and recognised. Now, obviously, the um, steps that are taken through um, the uh, guidance that is put in place about mainstreaming, for example, provide some of the templates about how we need to meet the needs of young people with additional support needs. Um, but the fact that there's been such a, a significant increase in the identification of needs suggests to me that local authorities are taking a much um, more rigorous and comprehensive view of those needs and ensuring that they are captured. And what follows from that is the importance of ensuring those needs are met uh, as a result. OK, I may come back to that, but thank you very much, Ross. Thank you, uh, Convener. <clears throat> Just to, to follow up the Convener's point around um, identification, I understand absolutely what you're saying, Cabinet Secretary, around um, guidance and local authorities more rigorously um, ensuring identification, but you didn't quite address the issue of inconsistency. If it was to put it this way, um, in Western Bartonshire, there are roughly five times as many children in school with <coughs> identified additional support needs as in North Lanarkshire. Those are two local authorities with very similar demographics, children with very similar backgrounds, but huge inconsistency in identified additional support needs. Are you at all concerned that it is challenging to effectively allocate additional support needs funding when there is such considerable inconsistency? The, I, think there's, there's, I think there's two different things, two different issues at play here. One is about um, the identification of the needs of young people and to ensure that they are fulfilled by their interaction with the education system. And the guidance that we provide around um, mainstreaming, I think, helps to structure that judgment that's made educationally, child by child, about what's the appropriate educational setting for them to be um, to be educated. So, th so th there's that there's that assessment framework that I think helps in that respect. There's then the disparity argument that Mr. Greer fairly raises about the comparison of and. and the Western Bartonshire and North Lanarkshire examples are, are at the extremes. Now, I suppose the, we get in here to the, the nub of some of the debate about what's the proper role for, the, for central government in relation to the judgments of individual local authorities, because you know, it's up to local authorities to follow that mainstreaming guidance, follow that assessment guidance, and if it's resulted in Western Bartonshire coming to this conclusion and North Lanarkshire coming to that conclusion. Those are distinctive decisions made by individual local authorities. And Parliament uh, quite regularly expresses its view that local authorities should be allowed to get on with things, um, free from central government interference. Um, but Mr Gear raises a pretty fair point about the disparity that's there. I think the, the, the opportunity for us to assess that is through inspection of local authorities for educational purposes. And as Mr Gray will know, um, we have recommenced inspections of individual local authorities to assess their performance in meeting the
the educational needs of young people. And um, through the means of that inspection, we have the opportunity to probe some of that disparity that's been raised in the question. Thanks. Um, I've raised recently with you issues around school inspection regimes and, and how much importance they place on additional support needs. But um, looking at the money that is allocated directly from central government um, in the budget announcement, Mr Mackay announced a, a £10 million fund for additional support needs. My understanding is that that was to go directly to charities who support young people with ASN. Would you be able to develop further on that and explain how that money will be allocated? Um, we certainly, um, I can, we're, we're giving consideration to all of these issues to make sure that we are able to satisfy ourselves that the needs of young people can be met in this respect and um, we will of course be happy to share information about that as we develop our thinking. Is the government at all concerned that the funding cuts which have quite directly affected additional support needs provisions, so around 500 ASN teachers, roughly the same number of, of assistants I believe, um, is damaging the level of support for the principle of mainstreaming. That very often when the concerns are raised around this, they're not in fact around the principle of mainstreaming, but they come as a result of 10 years of budget cuts, meaning that whilst a, a child with additional support needs can be in a mainstream school, they're often not included because those support services aren't there. And without that funding going back into local authority budgets, the effectiveness, the success of that policy area could potentially be undermined. The, the principle of mainstreaming, and, and this is at the heart of the guidance that the government has recently issued in this respect, is that um, we have to make a judgment about the correct educational setting to meet the needs of, of young people. And in some circumstances, that will not be in a mainstream option. And, in, uh, and, and that is absolutely the correct judgment to be arrived at. If I look at, uh, but if we are deploying the principle of mainstreaming, then there has to be effective support in place to make sure that young people can, um, can, can have their needs met. Now, when I look at the, 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 the statistical information that's available on this, the most recent data I have available for 2015-16 shows that local authorities spent just over £4.9 billion on education in Scotland. And of that, £584 million, 12% of total educational spend, was on additional support for learning. Now, that was, in fact, an increase of £5 million on 2014-15, which is a 2.7% increase in cash terms compared to 2014-15 and a 1.9% increase in real terms. Now, I appreciate that these, this data is not um, for the most recent financial years, but it's the most recent that's available to me. And I, I cite that data because I think it's important that we recognise that within the judgments been made by local authorities, the fundamental answer to Mr Greer's question um, has to be demonstrated by the resources that are put in place. And on the most recent data that I've got available to me, um, it appears that local authorities are providing that support. And I certainly see, um, as I am out and about in the education system, the manifestation of that support. Now, it's obviously something that we have to keep under active review because um, it's all very well having a principle of mainstreaming, but if it doesn't actually deliver on the educational promise to young people who have additional needs, and also to the young people who don't have educational uh, additional needs but who need their colleagues and compatriots to be properly supported so that their education can prosper, um, we, 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 we need to be attentive to, uh, to some of those issues. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Michelle? Yes, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Can, can I just pick up on some of that? Um, I, I have the same figure as you in terms of spend, the 12%, 12 um, but you're saying that it, that it identifies that um, the schools are actually delivering services adequate, or, or you imply that it would be adequate. But, but the rest of the numbers are, are worrying as well. The number of teachers with additional support for learning as their main subject has fallen by nearly 15%. Um, ASN teacher numbers have fallen. We've got educational psychologists <coughs> down by 10%. So can I ask, what conversations have you been having you know, directly with, with the teaching unions and the schools around the strains around supporting children with additional support for learning? 
Well, certainly the, 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 the challenges of um, ensuring the needs of young people with additional support needs are met within our schools is something that I regularly discuss with individual teachers, schools, uh, teaching unions uh, and also with local authorities because it is a challenging environment and it has to be well supported. I think the, the, some of the data, and, and I, I think we, you know, we, I'm very happy to, to look in greater depth at some of the detail that um, Michelle Ballantyne raises, and, and I'm familiar with that, that data, because some of the, because of the mainstreaming principle, there will be more teachers who are habitually interacting with young people with additional support needs than those who will just be categorised as additional support for learning teachers. And one of the issues the committee has raised with me in the past has been about the effectiveness of initial teacher education taking due account of the needs of means. Because if, if we apply the principle of mainstreaming, then we have to apply that right the way through the system so that every teacher, whoever they are, has an understanding of some of the challenges that have to be made. So I think as we look at some of this detail, we have to look with care at whether or not the fact that we apply the mainstreaming principle doesn't actually drive the changes in the teacher numbers that Michelle Bantine has raised on those specific categorisations, given the fact that we have a rising number of teachers within the context of a rising number of teachers within the teaching profession. Uh, so I'm very happy to look in more detail at some of those issues as we explore the central point which Ross Greer has raised with me, which is about whether or not the needs of young people are being effectively met within the system. Uh, picking up on that, uh, in terms of looking at it, does the Cabinet Secretary accept that um, the mainstreaming principle, whilst welcome, does mean that in a classroom, a teacher's time can, can be very absorbed by a, a, a number of the pupils within the classroom, and that actually the absence of a teaching assistant or an additional support needs assistant um, can actually be detrimental to the classroom overall. Um, and with a 73% increase in children identified as having additional needs, um, what kind of thoughts does the Cabinet Secretary have around how teachers are going to manage their stress levels um, because the, resort, the lack of resource within the classroom is going to create increasing stress levels for teachers. I think there's, there's, there's two points in that. One is the fact that um, I, I do acknowledge that there are the, 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 this is a stressful environment and there are de demands placed on teachers. And I, so I, I acknowledge that and, and that's why uh, I think it's important that we properly and effectively uh, support the um, the teaching profession in this respect. The second point is about the careful judgment that has to be arrived at about the correct educational setting for young people, because as, as I've said to Mr Greer, mainstreaming will not work for everybody and it's not appropriate to work for everybody. So ju careful judgments need to be made to ensure that the educational needs of all children can be met by a young person with additional needs being placed in a classroom. Um, and where that can't be done, then that young person should be educated in a distinctive environment. But where it is planned to do that, we have to make sure there's the proper and effective support in place. Now, if we look at the, um, the numbers of staff supporting pupils with additional support needs, uh, we saw a rise in between 2015 to 2016. Uh, we've obviously seen a rise in the number of teachers in general. So I think we are seeing a pattern of um, the resources being put in place to ensure that, that uh, the, 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 the principle of mainstreaming can be delivered effectively. Thank you. George, you wanted to, you're just yes, supplementary. Convener and morning, Cabinet Secretary. I just want to go on about what Ross Greer was talking about with regard to the disparity within areas. You know, I'm, I'm a very practical individual and uh, I try to look for solutions uh, where possible. And would there not be a case that the proposed regional collaboratives could be quite helpful in ASN in particular with the idea of, you know, getting the right resource in the right area at the right time to ensure that areas are working together to make that work? Now, 
that's just me sitting here listening to the debate today and coming up with that solution. But please, don't be shy if I'm talking complete nonsense, Cabinet Secretary, tell me. But uh, but do we not believe that that would there'd be a role for the regional collaboratives in that? There's quite clearly um, <coughs> the opportunity in regional collaboratives as part of the purpose of their establishment to encourage the sharing of good practice and good performance. And the approaches that can best be taken, if we take the example that Mr Gleer cited with, uh, between um, Western Partnership and North Lanarkshire, these are authorities within the, the West Partnership. So there is obviously the opportunity for some collaborative learning to be undertaken within the regional arrangements. So I think there is, th there is that opportunity that can be taken forward. Uh, and also the opportunity to, uh, I think, have a broader discussion around how we most effectively meet the, the needs of young people, because I think we will all be familiar with how, um, where mainstreaming works. It works, it has a profound impact on the young people affected. So I, I, I come to this discussion from the point of view of being an admirer of the mainstreaming principle, because I've seen many good examples of it being successful. But I'm not dewy-eyed sufficiently to, be, to take the view that it's going to work in all circumstances. And we've therefore got to make a pragmatic judgment, child by child, about how the support can be put in place to, to meet their needs. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Daniel and Angela. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, 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 Secretary, you just briefly mentioned initial, initial teacher education, and I think there's probably three broad components at issue here. One is identification, the other is about additional resources that are brought to bear, and then finally it's about the, the training and expertise of teachers themselves, which obviously initial teacher education is part of, but so is ongoing uh, continuing professional development. But that, that's precisely one of the things that you know, we've heard evidence over the last year has has suffered in recent years. I mean, do you think there's there's a need to look at the resources available for continuing professional development, especially for things such as neurodevelopmental disorders, you know, for things like dyslexia, uh, uh, dyspraxia, ADHD, and ASD? Um, and, and what are your reflections on, on the need to reflect that in, in the resourcing in our schools? I think the the issues that um, Mr Johnson raises are all um, important issues that uh, are part of the wider discussion about the enhancement of professional learning and uh, that is a, a core function of educational provision within Scotland. Um, there should be, uh, on an ongoing basis, uh, a, a, an emphasis on professional learning and development. Uh, one of the areas that I am taking forward as part of the education reforms is the strengthening of career progression routes, which will enable opportunities to be available to members of the teaching profession to develop different specialisms within their teaching role. So I think as a broad summary, I would say that the opportunities for professional development in teaching largely are to follow an administrative leadership route I want to broaden that out to um, establish uh, opportunities for subject <laughs> leadership and also for specialism leadership. And some of the issues that Mr Johnson raises um, would undoubtedly be covered in that respect. But uh, I certainly think there has to be an emphasis on um, continuous professional development. Um, it is not all just about um, initial teacher education and um, the education system. Um, is, con is uh, configured to enable that to be the case. So, so can I say, actually, if you... OK. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I wonder if you can indicate what changes you made to your budget as a consequence of the report we provided on additional support needs? Because I'm very concerned that this discussion is quite theoretical. But everything that we've been given in evidence, anecdotally, when we meet with teachers and others, when we meet parents and so on, that young people with additional support needs who might in the past have had an individual personal support that's shared mm -hmm. across a whole class, or the whole class only gets this person once a week rather than twice, three times, four times a week. Um, we had evidence from Enable and others that young people with learning disabilities, their definition of mainstream education was maybe half a day a day. And I think everybody shared the concern across the committee about the reality of mainstreaming and the support that's required from specialists in order to allow young person to access education. So I just wondered what what confidence we have that the response to that 
report is in the budget itself. Uh, I think the the points that were uh, made in relation to the um, funding that's available through um, local government, which is principally delivering in these areas. I talked in my answer to Mr Greer about the increases that we've seen there, the resources that are in place in the uh, to respond to the questions that are arising out of the, the Doran review. Um, and I think we also have to look at some of the data that's available to us that um, looks at the positive destinations that are achieved by young people with additional support needs, because the the convener started off asking me about the outcomes that are achieved, and we now see a situation where young people with additional support needs, 87.1% of them have a positive destination, which is um, an increase on the situation in 2011-12. So there's a, um, a indications of the strengthening of the um, the. Uh, the, the, the achievements of young people as a consequence of their interaction with the education system where they have additional support needs. I mean, apart from the fact that it's a real terms cut to local government budgets, which must put phenomenal pressure on them to deliver any of these things, it's a slight um, sideways step for me, but I'm interested in your definition of a positive destination. I'm very concerned, um, knowing young people myself who are in um, precarious work, with no guaranteed hours, no certainty of when their shifts will be, I would be looking to the Scottish Government to assure us that that is not defined as a positive destination. There is a major problem at UK level with DWP, defining jobs that are utterly insecure as being you have to take these jobs or you're going to be sanctioned or whatever. And it, you, know, you may not have done a lot of thinking as yet, but I would be looking for a reassurance from you that you will strip out of positive destinations these highly insecure jobs where you would say that the level of exploitation is very high mm. and the lack of security is a major concern? Well, a, a positive destination will be um, defined as um, sustained employment, um, at, uh, involvement in a college or a university place. And I, I'm very happy, along with my colleague, the Fair Work Secretary, um, Keith Brown, to look at the issues about positive destinations that uh, Joanne Lamont raises. Um, because all of us want to see the young people being able to progress into sustainable uh, positive destinations as a consequence of their involvement in the education system. And um, we will, uh, and our, our efforts and our interventions are designed to enable them to do so. Okay. Thank you. Ruth? Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Ma Secretary. Um, I represent um, North Ayrshire, which is a attainment. Uh, challenge authority and have seen and heard about good work that they're doing um, in the schools that are having a really positive effect on, on kids and their, their families. Um, in Save the Children's um, submission to the committee, they stress the need for robust um, information <coughs> being available to schools about what's actually effective in closing the attainment gap. Um, the government, of course, have produced the interventions for equity framework to support schools and I think that's probably a very welcome piece of guidance. However, um, as we kind of move forward, I wonder if you could outline what particular types of interventions are being, how you'll assess what particular types of interventions are being made, um, which ones are effective, which are least effective and how that knowledge will be shared across the country um, just to ensure that, that the pupil equity funding is being used in the most appropriate way for everyone. Well, the approach that we've taken is not to be not to be prescriptive about this, and I think it would be wrong to be prescriptive about this, because there will be a range of different interventions that will be successful in closing the poverty-related attainment gap. Now, as time progresses, evidence will become clearer based on the um, achievement of CFE levels and in the tangible difference in the performance of young people as a consequence of, uh, of interventions that are taken forward. Now, to, to, to cite a, a local example in Ruth Maguire's area, uh, North Ayrshire Council invested in the establishment of a professional learning academy, which, if my memory says me right, is in uh, uh, Crew. Uh, uh, <laughs> I was just about there. Um, but. What the purpose of that intervention was, was to strengthen pedagogical experience within schools. 
And from the evidence I can see, and we cite this actually in the National Improvement Framework Report, where we, um, we, we specifically refer to the strength of the uh, Professional Learning Academy in, in, in strengthening professional capability within schools um, uh, is being manifested. So we will we'll see examples, evidenced examples of what is successful. We'll also see evidenced examples of what is not successful. And we should and we have to be tolerant of that because there will be things that will not work as part of the interventions we take forward. But the crucial thing is we must learn from that and make sure that learning is, is, is shared more widely. In terms of the, 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 the range of different interventions that could be deployed, uh, the government has entered into a partnership with the Education Endowment Foundation to identify proven um, examples internationally of interventions that can be effective. That material is available in the National Improvement Hub for um, the teaching profession to access. And obviously, as time goes on, we will continue to refine that. That's not a, that's not held in aspect. That's a moving um, a collection of interventions that we think will be successful. And of course, we'll see the fruits of this in the CFE levels information and in the wider assessment of the closing of the attainment gap, which I, form, I concluded the consultation about uh, with the publication of the um, the National Improvement Framework Report and the Monitoring Framework for Closing the Gap uh, just uh, last Tuesday, actually. So, uh, we will we have the arrangements in place to share that knowledge, uh, we have the arrangements in place to, to learn from the experience, and we obviously will be monitoring very closely the effectiveness of particular interventions. Um, Cameron Secretary, additionality was a sort of fundamental principle of people equity funding. So how are the government assessing that schools really are using it for additional purposes? And um, notwithstanding the government's wish to not be prescriptive, um, is there any, would you intervene if it was not being used for additionality? And how I, would that I've certainly, where, where I've <coughs> felt um, that additionality was not implicit in the arrangements we put in place, um, I have intervened, um, and I would continue to do so uh, if I felt additionality was not uh, at the heart of the decision making about people equity funding. Okay, um, and just briefly on on the guidance, I appreciate it's only been in place since April, but I'm wondering what sort of feedback the government has received so far on the guidance, and if there are any. I mean, you said you're you're changing it as it's ongoing, so I assume. One of the one of the things we've got to be mindful of is about bureaucratic burdens, and I I certainly want to to minimise those, and I want to op encourage uh, a climate of professional development and professional integrity. Uh, so we will be looking um, in consultation with COSLA and with the Association of Directors of Education and other key stakeholders about some of the lessons we learn about um, the implementation of pupil equity funding. If it's too bureaucratic, then we'll need to tackle that, and uh, I'm very prepared to do so. Okay. Just finally, um, al along those lines, thinking about um, procurement and bureaucratic burden, I appreciate that the guidance for um, PEF makes it clear that the purchase of resources and equipment um, must comply with existing um, procurement procedures that are in place. Um, I've been given an example, not from my own local authority area, but from another, where a head teacher was trying to purchase a relatively small item, but the, the, the process for buying it was just um, quite silly, to be honest. There was a, a very lengthy process. Is there, do you have any comments on that? Well, certainly, if, if, it's, a, if it's a minor issue and it's been <coughs> caught up in a procurement process that appears over the top, I'd be very happy to, to look at that example and, and to try to reflect some of that pragmatism within the procurement guidance that's available to individual schools. Because I don't want this to be... Um, you know. The, the, there's a careful balance that has to be constructed here between the utilisation and deployment of public money and sensible, pragmatic judgments about interventions that teachers believe to be valuable and important. And I set that in the context of one of the comments that I made earlier on, that, that some of these interventions will not work, and we have to acknowledge that and be tolerant of that point and respect it um, and learn from it as part of this process, and I certainly am prepared to do so. And I've made that clear publicly. Thank you.
Okay, I've got a number of people that want to uh, ask a question. Ross, have you got a very short... Yep. Uh, well, I hope so. Um, <laughs> me, me too. <laughs> um, Cabinet Secretary, un under the um, attainment funding, it's I think, 666 additional full-time equivalent uh, teachers, uh, their staff, have been recruited. Do you know how many of them are on temporary contracts? Because that would not seem an ideal way to close the attainment gap through year-on-year -year temporary work. I don't think <coughs> I have to hand that detail, um, but I certainly am very happy to, uh, to uh, provide that information uh, to the committee <coughs> if we have it. Uh, I'm not sure if we have... Um, I don't think we'll have a, a to that. I, I don't think I've got it to hand to that degree of detail, but we'll 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 come back on that. Thank you, uh, Tavish. No. You wanted to come in, George. Yes, uh, Cabinet Secretary. One of the one of the obviously this works for me. SIMD figures are used as a way of targeting the where the resource goes, and in an area like mine. It does get to the right area at the right time, you know, the right place. But the problem is with the figures in more rural areas and things like that, there tends to be uh, difficulty. Uh, we were talking to some of the academics recently, and Keir Bloomer, I asked him if he, he kept saying it wasn't, uh, it was a blunt sentiment. Uh, but I said, what's your idea, Mr Bloomer? And I'm still waiting for an answer because he never had one. You know, uh, is there any way that the government's looking at different ways to take in, you know, across the country? Uh, how we actually deal with getting the resource into the right area? The, the, the two available mechanisms for me to allocate pupil equity funding, since it's driven principally by, uh, well, exclu exclusively by the identification of the incidence of poverty, is either through the mechanism of the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation or by the eligibility for free school, for the registration for free school meals. Now, the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation essentially identifies groupings of poverty. It, the free school meal um, eligibility identifies a much finer instance of poverty within individual communities. So I opted for the free school meals um, uh, approach simply because it gave a greater degree of coverage than the SIMD uh, approach would take. I am, however, aware, and I've had representations of this from um, a number of rural authorities, about the fact that some of the take-up of free school meals in rural areas <coughs> in some circumstances is not as high as it would ordinarily be expected to be because in small communities it can be difficult people are perhaps reluctant to identify themselves as requiring or being eligible for that support. So I've, I'm, I'm very open to how we might take further steps to reflect that in the approach that we take, and I've had a, a number of conversations with local authorities about how we might do that. Now, having said all of that, we haven't got to a mechanism that enables us to do that yet, uh, but I am very much open to that question. OK, thanks. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I just, just further than that, my, my colleague, uh, Joanne Lamont, uh, talks quite a lot about S SIMD not just being uh, impacting on the individual or the family, but the reason why it's, it's a useful tool is because it's the area that may well suffer from the knock-on effects of the, the deprivation that's around there, so therefore would impact the schools. You wouldn't be, or, or would you be thinking, when you're looking at, at other mechanisms, of replacing a SIMD, or would you be thinking of doing something in parallel with it or, or alongside it? I've, I've got absolutely no plans to uh, change I'm anything to do with SIMD, it. just, just to just just that point, that point. can I get out? No, absolutely none whatsoever, yeah. and it's, it's, not, it's not my responsibility to tackle that issue. My, my only point is, that, is to talk about distribution mechanisms, yeah. and um, I think SIMD data underpins <coughs> much of the framework that I've put in place to assess whether we are or are not closing the poverty-related attainment gap, and you're absolutely correct, Convener, it provides a very substantial um, element of the framework that enables us to make judgments about that point. But when it comes to the distribution, if we're trying to absolutely target 
individuals who are living in circumstances of poverty to use education to try to improve their life chances, we have to go beyond SIMD, which is my point about free school meal entitlement, but also my point to Mr Adam that there is more we could do be beyond that to deal with the issue of rurality, but I don't yet have an answer to that question. But it won't in any way affect the, the use or the prevalence of SIMD. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That was the answer I was hoping to get. Uh, Liz? Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I wonder if I could just ask uh, on the question of uh, teacher numbers, which has obviously been something that has been very much in the uh, news of late. When we took evidence uh, from various um, groups about the workforce planning issue, there seemed to be very considerable confusion about the model that was being used. Could you explain what you think that model should look like and why you think it isn't working very well just now? Um, well, the, the model has to take into account a variety of um, indicators, which at core will be about um, pupil numbers, distribution of those pupil numbers, the distribution of the school estate, um, and that material tends to produce some, what I would call, raw numbers about the requirements of the teaching profession. What then has to be added to that is more subjective information about um, recru recruitment levels, retention levels, and the implications of policy interventions on the education system. And that will essentially provide us with a, a, a perspective of workforce numbers. Um, now that is, so it's a combination of different factors, some of them um, more statistically provable, like pupil numbers, than others. Um, uh, but it's a combination of those uh, different factors. Now, on the question of the, the latter part of Liz Smith's question, um, which was, um, I, I, as ever, diplomatically expressed about why it's not working, um, the, I think if I, we have to, we have to look, we have to look at, we have to look at a longer term period in history to to come to these conclusions to see why we are where we are. If we go back seven years, we had a problem of teacher unemployment. And everybody knows that, and Parliament was concerned about that. And so we had to take action to address the issue of teacher unemployment, um, which resulted in a number of things. It resulted in, for example, uh, changes to um, intake into initial teacher education in 2010, 11, and 11, 12. And it also influence changes to the remuneration arrangements for supply teachers, um, which had an effect on the availability of posts for new probationer teachers, which could be freed up if there were fewer supply teachers who were in post. Now, when we look at the implications of all of that, um, we see, for example, in the loosened data, the highest level of probationary employment, 88%, uh, which is welcome. We also see a rising number of uh, intakes into initial teacher education over the course of the last few years, uh, culminating this year with an intake of 3,861 into initial teacher education, um, higher than in any uh, previous year since 2009-10. And um, a rising number of teachers in the profession. So with the teacher numbers today, in 2017, at the highest level they have been at since 2011. So the workforce planning model has, with all of its different factors, is resulting in us having an increased number of teachers in our schools today than at any stage since 2011. So I think the, the workforce planning model, if I've got one observation to make, and this is an anecdotal observation, is that I think 
the retention rate of teachers has been lower than we would have expected. So I think, to flip that over, I think more teachers have left the profession than the model would have expected to be the case. And a lot of the other interventions that I'm making in the, uh, in the system about trying to reduce workload or about the steps we've just taken in terms of pay to try to improve remuneration, because I appreciate it's been very tough for people over the course of the last few years, have affected the willingness of teachers to be in the profession. We also have had to do something about supply remuneration to try to encourage um, a, well, registered teachers that could do a shift in the schools. <laughs> <laughs> If I, could, if I could delicately make a suggestion. Indeed. Um, Cabinet Secretary, thank you for that. And you know, thank you for the, uh, the good news there. If I was uh, a parent in Murray or in Edinburgh or in Perth and Ken Ross, I have to say I wouldn't be persuaded by that answer at all because they are obviously in scenarios where they don't have sufficient teachers uh, and where you know, we heard yesterday that some uh, a council may be deciding in primary years that they would only uh, be taught for some of the time. So it's a very depressing picture for these parents. What short-term uh, remedy do you have for this situation? Because it is very serious, and I hope you would acknowledge that. Well, the, f the first thing is that I, you know, I, I, I've given a detailed answer on the workforce planning model. Um, but I, I'm the first to accept that there are challenges about teacher recruitment around the country. So although we've got a welcome increase of 543 in the number of teachers this year, uh, I accept there are still challenges around the country, and I'm the first to accept that. Now, in terms of what we have, what we have done and what we are doing in relation to that, uh, I think we've got to be um, we've got to be um, open to different ways of proceeding, and let me explain why that's important. The in the the initial teacher intake expectations for 2017-18, um, we planned and made provision for the recruitment of 4,058 students to enter through the various established means. And we successfully recruited 3,657. So, so clearly there are more places available for individuals to enter the teaching profession than we're prepared to do so at what I would describe to be the <coughs> younger cohort, which is school leavers going into uh, an undergraduate course and um, a university students going into the PGDE. We put in place new routes to open up other aspects of the other routes into teaching, and a further 204 individuals are coming through those routes. So by the reforms the government has put in place, we have managed to increase the intake from 3,657 to 3,861. So we've got closer to our initial expectation of 4,058 as a consequence of the reforms that we've put in place to get... Tony, what are you going to do to ensure that these additional teachers, which you say are in the system, are deployed in the schools which desperately need them? And I mean desperately need them just now. <laughs> what are you going to do to ensure that these schools get these teachers? Well, fundamentally, that's an issue for individual local authorities to consider. I, you know, what, what we're working with our local authority partners to do is to create a teaching pool that can enable teachers to be um, deployed uh, in different educational uh, situations. Um, so my, my objective is to increase the supply of teachers through that initial teacher education. I've also asked for further proposals about how we can encourage more uh, individuals, what I would describe as career switchers, to move from existing careers, which is what STEM bursaries are about, to try to encourage people to make a switch of career into teaching at a later stage in life, because clearly there's more places available for younger people than are prepared to come forward. So we've got to encourage career switchers to, to make those transitions. <coughs> if, if, if you, if, if Elizabeth would forgive me, and I'll, I'll complete the answer. Um, the other. Um, step that we're taking is to try to activate more individuals who are currently registered to teach but who could return to the profession and who could contribute through the supply model as well and I've already acknowledged one of my objectives one of my frustrations about the length of time it's taken us to get to an agreement about teachers pay is that months ago there were changes agreed 
to supply arrangements which I haven't been able to put into practice until the whole agreement was reached, which we reached last week. And I'm very pleased that we reached it last week, but we reached the agreement about supply arrangements months ago. And I wasn't able to implement that without the whole agreement being in place. And part of that is to try to increase the flow of individuals. Now, in the particular areas that um, Elizabeth has talked about, Murray and the Highlands and Islands, and uh, to an extent Perth and Kinross is relevant in this respect, um, I have been encouraging the University of the Highlands and Islands to develop um, more presence on, on initial teacher education, and they have done so, and I very much welcome that. Um, but I think there's a particular opportunity because of the model of education that the UHI operates on, individuals can live in their community, get their education in their community, and ideally, once graduated, teach in that community. And that's a point that I'm encouraging the, the, the University of the Highlands Islands to develop yet further, so that we have, in some of the hard to, to support locations, teachers who are living in those communities, individuals who are currently living in those communities who could become teachers by means of their um, interaction with the University of the Highlands and Islands. My, my final point, Cabinet Secretary, uh, would be uh, this, and it's, it's a question about whether there is a block in the system that is preventing local authorities from knowing where the pool of potential teachers actually lies. As you say, it's very much up to local authorities to make that decision about who to employ, which is true. <coughs> Do you think there is a block in the system that, for some reason, these local authorities are not clear about the potential people who might work in their schools? No, because every, every teacher, every registered teacher is registered with the GTCS. And I've, like, already, I've had the G, uh, asked the GTCS already to make clear to all non-practising teachers already since the SNCT agreement was reached last week about the changes to supply cover. So there's no, there's, abs there's absolutely no impediment to, so we know who the non-registering, the non-practising teachers are and the GTCS know that, well I don't know, the GTCS know schools because they're obviously choosing not to do so. <laughs> well, but some of them, but you know, well for example, um, what, you know, um, Graham Logan, who's the, um, been the interim chief inspector of education, was telling me that he got an email from the from, from the GTCS saying to him, as a non as a non teaching teacher, why don't you do a supply shift? Mm -hmm. um, which is proof that this, the system is working now. <coughs> Mr. Logan has other responsibilities, so why are they not choosing? To, well, people are making their choices about, but there's certainly the means of contacting those individuals who are not teaching to encourage them to teach are available to us through the GTCS and we have utilised those in, uh, on a number of occasions since I became Education Secretary and there's no impediment to us doing that uh, in the future. Okay, thank you. Tavish and then Richard. Thank you, Akavina. So if it is for local government, as you say, to sort out the problems of teacher recruitment that Liz Smith has been talking about, how does imposing the pupil-teacher ratio from the centre help? Because it's a crucial element of ensuring that young people have access to um, an appropriate level of teaching resource, given that the teaching <coughs> resource is the most significant contributor to the um, educational uh, performance of young people. But if you don't have a maths teacher in an Edinburgh school, how does the, how does the centrally imposed pupil-teacher ratio help that school? Well, what we've got to make sure is that we've got the maths teachers available for those individuals, which is, why, which, is why, which is why I take steps such as putting in place STEM bursaries to encourage individuals to enter yeah, teaching I, I uh, to make point. that transfer. I get that point. What I don't understand genuinely is, is how a, a pupil-teacher ratio, which is the part that central government imposes on local authorities is consistent with sorting out local government's uh, difficulties in teacher recruitment, which you've openly and very sensibly accepted. And because we have, to, we have to take steps to ensure the correct relationship exists to ensure high quality education is, avail is available for young people. And yes, we've got, we've got a challenge about recruitment to the teaching profession in the current environment, but Seven years ago, we had way too many teachers. So the, the key challenge is to get that approach correct and in the correct balance 
to make sure that young people can get the educational resources that um, uh, that they are entitled to but and if, that will affect if, their performance. But if Highland Council can't recruit enough, I mean, Strathcona Prime is going to close after Christmas, as you are no doubt yeah, very so. well aware, because it, it doesn't have two teachers. How is, a, how is a ratio set by you helping Highland Council solve the problem of Strathcona Primary School? Well, the bit, well, because what we're doing is we're taking a whole host of different interventions to boost the number of teachers coming into the profession, such as the fact that we've got 3,861 teachers coming through initial teacher education as we speak. But none of them are and stuck on, on, on the 9th of January. Well, but, but that's, about, that's about local authority. And I've, well, I've just gone through the UHI options as well, which are very specific means about trying to enable uh, individuals who are living in Highland Island communities to be able to secure access to a teaching qualification within their own communities which then might enable them to teach in Strathconnan or other primary schools in the Highlands and Islands. Mm -hmm. So there's a range of interventions but fundamentally if we depart from the idea of recognising the significance of pupil-teacher ratios as enhancing the quality of education then I think we'd be making a mistake as a country. But you don't therefore believe that pupil-teacher ratios should be set by the local authority or set by a school? A, I think they should be set across our education system to give young people across the country an assurance about the quality of education no, they're going to I asked, experience. I asked if it should not the pupil-teacher ratio in a school be set by the head teacher and her, her, his or her promoted well, post? I think it's part of the framework of education to guarantee the quality of education around the country. So why does the centre know better than a head teacher in a primary school or in a secondary school about how many kids should be in the class? Uh, because fundamentally we all know that the strength and the quality of education is driven by the access that individuals have to individuals individual teachers and that should be an assurance that yeah. young people have across I the country. I couldn't agree more but if you can't get the teachers then the pupil ratio is irrelevant. Well, well but my point is that we should well but my but, well we're in danger of having a circular I, argument I here because I think, we're, I think we're actually in agreement here because we both agree that the quality of teachers is important yeah, sure. and we both agree that it's important to get as many teachers into the schools as we possibly can do and I accept and I first accept we've got challenges in that respect which is why we're putting in such an effort to get more teachers into the profession and to get them to stay longer. Yeah, I entirely agree with all that, entirely agree with all that. What I'm trying to push at is why, uh, sorry, is how a centrally driven target in relation to pupil teacher ratios helps local government with that huge challenge that you've very fairly accepted they Well, I don't, I don't actually think that the pupil teacher ratio has got anything to do with the challenges in Strathconnan. The I'm challenges, sure you're right. they're I'm not, sure they've right. got absolutely nothing to do with yeah, it. The I'm challenges sure in Strathconnan right. are, they've got two teachers that are leaving yeah, right. and they can't replace them. That's the challenge there. Mm -hmm. So that's about teacher recruitment, mm -hmm. which is why the interventions I'm making with the University of the Highlands and Islands are so significant yeah. in this respect. But you'd accept, Mr Sweeney, that there are quite a number of submissions to the committee from other local, from local government, from particular councils, who say that one of the constraints on their ability to, to uh, tackle teacher recruitment is that ratio. Because it, uh, by definition, has no, implications for them. No, I don't. Because what <coughs> if I relaxed the position on pupil-teacher ratio, it would result in a reduction in the number of teachers, and I can't imagine the committee would be that cheerful how about do, that how issue. Do, how do you know that? Uh, because that's what happened in 2008-9. Uh, no, wait, let me get my numbers correct. In 2009 and 2010 and 2011, which is why we then had to put in place the constraints for the pupil-teacher ratio okay. to protect teacher numbers. OK, well, let me try it the other way around. So when... Yeah, well, let's try and do it more. The question's okay. Okay. OK. Uh, you, you plan, Mr Swinney, to give um, uh, head teachers more powers. Um, you do not plan to give them the ability, therefore, in this case, to do anything other than comply with, a national, with this national ratio. It, well, I, I think the pupil-teacher ratio is uh, an essential part of the quality of education in Scotland, yes. OK, final question, Can we, I apologise for going on about that. Um, uh, can I just check on the budget specifically, um, based on the SPICE briefing for members that was available, I think, on Monday, whether the 3% pay rise for teachers earning up to £30,000 is included in the draft budget published last week? Um, it's uh, assumed to be, yes. Assumed to be? I'm not sure I understand that. Uh, well, obviously, the, uh, an assumption has been made about public sector pay yes. within the <coughs> overall budget. Uh, obviously, there's a negotiation to be undertaken with the, through the channels of the yes. SNCT, into yes. which the government will be a party. Um, so it's assumed to be in those resources. Right. OK, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Richard. <coughs> thank you and welcome, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Liz Smith mentioned Murray Council, where there's a, a number of issues facing teacher recruitment at the moment. But I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will be pleased to know there's eight more teachers working in the Murray Council this time this year compared to last year. And I would urge the Cabinet Secretary 
to continue to support the training places at UHI and indeed Aberdeen, which are making a difference and appear to be going from strength to strength. Uh, one issue you may be interested to hear about, of course, is there's been a 67% increase in the number of women on maternity leave in Murray at the moment, which is a huge increase, which is leading to some challenges for the head teachers. Uh, but it's great for Murray's demographic trends, it's got to be said. But these are unexpected, uh, to a certain extent, uh, trends, a 67% increase in this case. <laughs> and, uh, I thought we were dealing with young people as well in this uh, committee. Uh, and the lack of supply teachers clearly is causing a number of issues in, in, in Murray's case uh, at the moment. But there are some issues I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can refer to in this context. Firstly, there's the issue of the head teacher vacancies. And one issue that many local authorities are raising is that it's difficult to recruit head teachers, particularly in primary schools, because the pay differentiate differential between deputy heads and, and heads doesn't justify the differential in responsibilities. And I was just wondering whether that was something that the Cabinet Secretary is in discussion with the profession over. Um, uh, yes, uh, the, I have had a number of discussions with the profession about these points. And the one of the elements of the SNCT agreement about the the teachers' pay deal for 2017-18 is that through the, the auspices of the SNCT, we will look at issues of terms and conditions um, as part of that process. And, and obviously the issues that Mr Lockhead raises are issues that can be raised in that process. Okay. Another issue relating to wider budgets within the government is head teachers are spending a lot of time dealing with issues that are not directly related to what might one might refer to as education, but maybe more social work uh, input would be required to deal with some of the issues that head teachers are having to deal with. Are there any discussions going on with local authorities or the profession about other help that can be brought into schools to deal with these kind of issues? One of the... Uh, I should... Just if I can add to my previous answer, the, the, the point that Mr Lockhead makes about... Um, about supply teacher availability, I hope, will be enhanced by the agreement that we've reached through the SNCT on changes to supply teacher remuneration, which will make it more remunerative for individuals to be um, to be active on the supply list, which I hope helps the situation in Murray, where I, I, I do appreciate there are challenges about maternity cover uh, that are in place, notwithstanding the increase in the number of teachers that uh, are active in Murray in the course of the last 12 months. Um, in, in relation to the, um, the, the the wider question that's been raised, um, I, I think there's a an opportunity for us to try to take forward a, a, a wider discussion with local government, who actually made the point to me during our discussions around the regional collaborative arrangements that local authorities, and this, this affects the kind of wider debate about education governance and the role of local authorities, one of the key points that local government makes in relation to the importance of them being um, in, uh, democratically accountable for education is that they are running the range of other services that Mr Lockhead referred to, which will have an effect on the well-being of children, uh, principally around social work and, and other specialist services. There will obviously be interactions from the health service. So I think the, 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 the resolution of some of these challenging questions about the workload of head teachers and the circumstances around which um, individuals are able to have their needs met will be, I think, able to be deployed by local authorities exercising their wider responsibilities um, in that respect. So I think there is it's a key part of the role of local government to be able to host those discussions, which are multidisciplinary, um, and they shouldn't all fall on the shoulders of, of head teachers to take forward these discussions. OK, thanks. That's, that's very helpful. And two final points. Firstly, in terms of career switchers, uh, one issue that's been put to me, although the Cabinet Secretary did mention bursaries, is that when people in uh, other careers want to change, perhaps, the teaching, which we should encourage to, to plug some of the vacancies, uh, there's a £6,500, give or take, cost of the fees to go to get your further qualification. And that quite often puts people off. And I just wondered, within the budget, is that something that could be addressed at all, given that £6,500 per um, 
aspiring teacher would not work out at a huge amount of money. I just wondered whether that's already <coughs> catered for or whether it's something you might want to think about. Well, p part of my thinking um, about the STEM bursaries w was to address the fact that it was particularly to target t um, career switchers and to recognise that they would invariably be people who had commitments by that stage in their life and foregoing a year of income is not an easy decision for any individual to make in their circumstances. So the, the thinking behind um, the STEM bursaries was to try to make that practical and tangible for individuals to make that switch. So I'm quite open to looking at um, different suggestions of this type. It's part of the dialogue I'm having with the um, the schools of education about the different propositions that they're bringing forward to try to find other routes to, um, to, to enable individuals to make a contribution to the teaching profession. Because what is clear from the data is that if our workforce planning model is saying to us for 1718, we need to have 4,058 teachers and we can only recruit into the education process 3,861, we must find other channels and routes to motivate individuals other than the, the fundamentally traditional routes of leaving school and going into teaching or doing an undergraduate degree and doing a postgraduate qualification. So I, I'm very open to, to some of these questions to, to, to be considered. Well, I very much welcome that because it's an issue beyond STEM subjects at yeah, yeah. primary level as well. And my final point is that uh, as councils face up to their, their budgets in the coming weeks, a number of councils are contemplating education cuts. And in Murray, where we are trying to attract teachers to apply to work in local schools, they're speaking about scrapping school librarians, reducing support for children with additional support needs, and also changing the arrangements for visiting specialists to schools for PE and music and so on, which is causing a lot of concern. Do you agree that the budget that's been announced by the government would hopefully give enough uh, assurance to such local authorities to not impose these education cuts? There is a, a, an annual process that local authorities undertake to identify savings, and there are weighty documents produced um, um, almost invariably by council officials which go through all of these particular uh, options, uh, and they're predicated on a financial assumption about what the budget may look like. Now, I know from my discussions with the finance secretary, that local authority, well, all local authorities are doing these things. Mr Lockhead cited the example in his own constituency in Murray. Um, I know from my discussions with the finance secretary that um, <coughs> these options have been worked up by local authorities assuming uh, a very different and much poorer financial settlement than has been delivered by the government in the budget. So um, I do hope after a period of, uh, of reflection local authorities can take um, a wise set of decisions in the context of the resources that are available to them by the settlement that's been put in place by the government. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, yeah, sure. I mentioned a follow-up from Richard Lockheadley in the questioning on teacher places. So, the Cabinet Secretary will know that in, in my area, the DLight programme has been tremendously successful, almost too successful, because pe people can't actually, people who want to actually access that course in a part-time course like that, that allows them to continue working, is actually oversubscribed. I've had quite a few people actually contacting me really frustrated they haven't been able to get into that course. But at the same time, you'll have the PG, uh, DE courses that of the, the traditional type that you've just mentioned undersubscribed. What happens to the funding? that's given to universities to provide the kind of traditional courses if they're undersubscribed? And could that not be channelled into expanding things like Daylight, where there is a, a big demand for that? Um, to date, we have not um, reclaimed resources from, from um, universities where they've been unable to fulfil traditional PGDE-type courses. Um, but. Uh, there, is scope, there is scope within the financial arrangements for us to claw that resource back and redeploy in other areas. And uh, obviously, uh, Gillian Martin raises an issue to which I'm giving active consideration, given the fact that um, we find ourselves in a situation where we've not been able to fulfil our expectations and we have to look at different approaches and different options to try to ensure that we have an adequate supply of teachers into the teaching profession. 
Thank you. Okay, Gillian, do you want to go on to your next line of question? Uh, yes. So I suppose I'll follow on from that. Um, <coughs> one, of, one of the issues in, in terms of early years is about the workforce planning around that. Um, and there are significant amounts of, of uh, funding being given into early years. Um, but one of the things that's not detailed so far is the um, funding that's going to be given to colleges around their part in training people for early years and childcare. Could the Cabinet Secretary expand on, on what that might be? Uh, well, obviously, the, uh, the, the, the role and, and, and focus of our colleges is to provide the, um, the graduates that we require to contribute uh, in a variety of different areas. So we, um, our, our work has been taking place for some time with colleges um, around the provision of these courses and these places to make sure that our expectations on the early years workforce can be fulfilled by the work that is undertaken by individual colleges. And in terms of the budget that's been given to, to, to childcare, I mean, a lot of it is ring-fenced, but some of it isn't. Um, and obviously, the, the huge part of it, the, the, the £202 million pounds ring fence, so that it goes to local government and that has to be spent on the, the, the childcare and early years priorities. But there's a £40.8 million funding that's not identified as being ring fenced. How can we ensure that that does go to the right places? Well, that's. Um, uh, there's a mixture of resources in there. Some of it um, will be resources that the government itself um, controls and deploys, and obviously we will ensure that that is spent very directly on um, early years activity. Uh, th th there's specific provision that's also in place for local authorities to essentially support the, um, the capacity building for the rollout of early learning and childcare, and we are working collaboratively with local authorities to ensure that those resources are used to support that expansion programme and to support it in line with the expectations that we all have for the sector. And the, the, the voluntary sector has a role to play in the, the early years provision. Um, what, what provision is the government making to ensure that they get the funding that they need? Some of that will come from the uh, either the interventions the government itself makes or the way in which the um, local authorities design the delivery of the commitment within their localities, because obviously there's going to be quite a mixed economy of how that provision is uh, is designed, involving uh, the use of external organisations, but also the use of in-house capacity within individual local authorities. The, the the mechanisms that, that we will put in place will be um, around a model which is essentially of the, the, the funding following the child, and uh, that will enable us to have sufficient um, flexibility to make sure that voluntary sector organisations are able to be supported to develop that provision. And just a, a further question on the, with regard to the colleges and the training around people. I know you're having ongoing discussions with colleges of the, the right type of training. There's a, obviously a, an enormous resource um, already out there, maybe people that are maybe coming back into the workforce, maybe have to having a period of maybe maternity leave or bringing up their own children that could be a, a, a massive resource to, to fill the gaps that we have for, for childcare provision. Is it been looked at the sort of circumstances around that demographic to get them back into to training so that they can, I mean, it's, there's obviously quite a lot of complex needs around the flexibility that could be required there. We've, we've run um, a very active national uh, communications campaign to encourage individuals to, to, to see the opportunity, because we've got, you know, we estimate that we will need um, something of the order of about 11,000 new employees to take part in the delivery of this commitment. So there's a huge employment opportunity over the course of the next three years for individuals. So we've run a very active uh, media campaign to encourage individuals to see this as an opportunity. That has obviously had particular elements of it where it's been targeted um, um, disproportionately towards um, men who are disproportionately poorly represented in the early years um, workforce. 
and um, and it's not exclusively towards men, but it's a, there's an element within that um, to encourage the take up of these opportunities and and. Obviously, that's part of an ongoing effort that we take forward with our local authority partners to make sure we have an adequate supply of individuals who are able to make their contribution. Okay, but do you recognise that there's yeah sorry that there's 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 a need to look at maybe the types of courses that are available and when they take place to allow people that maybe have family commitments in order to access that. I, I think that's that's an absolutely fair. A comment that uh, Julie Martin raises, and that's reflected in the discussions that we have with uh, individual colleges. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Right, yes, thank you. So, continuing on the theme of uh, early learning and childcare, um, I just want to pick up on something you said there about the funding follows the child, um, because one of the the issues, obviously, with the first rollout of 600 hours, is access to it. And if funding is truly following the child, what is your understanding of how places will be accessed and allocated? I think on the first, the first point I'd make is that in relation to the rollout of 600 hours, the data last week demonstrated um, virtually universal provision of an access to um, early years education for three and four year olds. 99% was the number. So that says to me, individuals are securing the necessary access to uh, the early learning and childcare provision that we have made. Obviously, as we move to 11.40 hours, there is the opportunity to deploy some more of the flexibility that would assist individual families. And that's very much the approach that's been taken. All of the material that we've published as a government uh, around this has been designed to to respect that need for flexibility within the, mark, the, 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 the provision. And we've talked about the opportunity for blended models to be put in place and that will very much be designed at local level and so we're giving the policy encouragement to these models and obviously we're in regular dialogue with local authorities about how they design the particular approaches that they will take forward okay well Picking up on that, um, the, the partnership price that's basically generally being offered to private nurseries sits somewhere between £3.45 and, at the absolute top end, £4 um, an hour. Now, obviously, with, with the expectation and, and, indeed, the commitment by private nurseries to pay the living wage and the on costs of, of delivering against um, the health and safety requirements that are there now, that sum is not going to meet all of their client base moving over to 1,143 hours. So what, what reassurance or, or, I suppose, uh, information can you give at this stage around how private nurseries in particular, as part of a blended model, will be able to sustain their finances going forward if everybody's taking up free childcare? And are you expecting there to be top-up fees against the private nurses? Um, because I have had a couple of people contact me and suggesting that they have been told within their contracts that if they want to have a partnership arrangement, that they will not be allowed to request top-ups. The, on the question of the availability of funding, you know, our funding is predicated on enabling local authorities to agree rates with uh, funded providers in the private and third sectors that enables them to pay the living wage to early learning and childcare workers. Um, so that's an assumption that's in the approach that's taken. So obviously, um, and we will be working to ensure that's reflected in what is available to providers at a later stage. So I hope that provides some of the reassurance that's required in this respect. I think in relation to the, 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 the question of top-up fees, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the, 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 the issue here in that I couldn't see any logical argument for saying that, you know, if, if provision was to be available from nine until three, let's say, there isn't, there shouldn't be an opportunity for a parent to top up to make it available from eight till six. It's the hourly top up. So if the fees for the nursery are five pounds an hour 
and the partnership um, payment is only three pounds forty-five. It, it's the nursery actually billing the parent for the differential. Um, well, I, I think I would need to I would need to have a look at the, some of the detail around about that. But certainly, the in relation to the funding that we intend to provide, <coughs> we intend to provide funding that should enable the payment of a living wage, which I recognise to be um, a material issue in relation to the, um, the, the 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 rates that are commonly agreed between local authorities and private providers. And can I ask one final one? Um, and the final one actually builds on that because obviously we're waiting for the outcome of the quality review group in terms of the direction of travel or where the balance will be, to be in terms of educational and, and childcare in these provisions and within these contracts. Now, can I just ask, what is your assumption around the budgets and particularly around your own assumptions of, of expectation of what that balance will be? Because obviously if it, if it runs down an educational requirement, i.e. teachers in place within early learning, the cost differential again will be significant as against um, pure childcare approach. Um, these questions are still very much active um, for active discussion with um, local authorities as we design the model that takes forward, but there will have to be a blend on those uh, on those questions, uh, and that will obviously have an effect on the overall cost of the provision. But um, th those issues are, uh, you know, very material to the design of the the model that we take forward. So the budget assumption that's in place, the the money you've allocated at the moment, does that is that predicated on on teachers being involved in those early years? Or childcare. It's predicated on a proportion of teachers that are um, involved in the system at this stage. Uh, I don't have the number, the proportion to hand um, in front of me, but I'm certainly happy to furnish the committee with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liz, you'd appoint a clarification. Uh, yeah, yes, it's just a point of clarification, Cabinet Secretary, in relation to uh, last week's uh, budget and the uh, Barclay review changes. Could you explain what advice the uh, Scottish Government has taken regarding the anomaly that will occur when a private profit-making uh, nursery will be eligible for a tax break, but those nurseries that belong to an independent school, which are obviously charities and which are assisting the Government and local authorities with provision for three- and four-year-olds, won't have that tax break? Is that not an anomaly? Uh, well, there'll be, there'll be, there will be... Um, Clearly, the government has responded to the Barclay review on the issues that have been raised. Um, a number of different decisions have been taken about the nature of provision, whether nurseries should be able to secure relief uh, from rates, which is a question um, distinctive in, 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 in that area of policy. Um, and decisions have been taken in relation to the um, relief for <coughs> private schools. So, you know, the government um, it will have con has considered uh, all of those different issues and come to the conclusions that it's come to. Okay, thank you, Savish. Thank you, Can I just ask a couple of brief questions on the educational reforms in terms of the budget? There is four million pounds in the budget for education reforms, but no detail below that. Would you help the committee with what that's going to be spent on? Um, there'll be uh, the, the resources will be spent to essentially advance the core propositions of the educational reforms, principally around um, collaboration um, amongst local authorities and the profession. Um, and to ensure that the objectives of the education reforms are achieved as a consequence. There is, of course, a broader um, educational reform spend which is contained within pupil equity funding and the Scottish Attainment Challenge. So does that mean regional improvement collaboratives will get a central budget? De I'll, I'll be considering yeah. and discussing with regional collaboratives um, what justification there is for that. Sure. I'll okay. be certainly involved in that discussion. No, that's fair enough. And, and on, on Education Scotland, obviously the core budget's been reduced, although in every year, for many years, there's been a fair whack of additional finance through the course of a year. Um, but you plan to give it additional responsibilities. Do you want to just explain how it well, can what do I, more with less? Well, what I want... Ed, Education Scotland is going to be changing its focus as an organisation, <laughs> and it will be increasingly active... Um, uh, more active on the ground and involved in the education system and 
um, along with the uh, requirements that I put on public bodies to operate efficiently, um, their budget has been set to reflect both of those priorities. Okay, so you're, you're open to further devolution of education. I mean, that sounds like devolution of education in Scotland to is. regional collaborators. Yes. And that that's, a, that's an essential part of the regional yeah. collaborators, and that is that Education Scotland will be um, much more visibly active yeah. in those areas and much more active in providing support out and about than um, being fundamentally a headquartered organisation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd just uh, like to ask some questions about the school estate. Um, so in the, the budget this year, it, it sort of um, rather abruptly uh, sort of put it that the Schools for the Future programme was coming to an end, uh, but there wasn't really any uh, mention about what would replace it. Um, and just kind of given the, the nature of the school estate, I was just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary could provide some insight as to what will replace that, that programme. I think it's important that we... Um, recognise the distance that's been travelled in this respect. We find ourselves today with 86% of schools being reported in good or satisfactory condition, which is an increase um, from 61% in 2007 when the government came to office. So there's been significant progress made in the, the school's estate, and there's obviously still a further um, three years in the programme, the existing School for the Future programme, to, to take its course. I expect to make some further announcements in the early part of uh, 2018 on the successor to the Schools for the Future programme, um, and obviously I'll advise Parliament of those details in due course. I mean, of course, the, the flip side to the, the statistics you were just quoting is that 14% that sort of, of, of schools are still uh, in poor or bad condition. And, and when you look at the pupil numbers and suitability of schools, that puts it at 16%. So there is a, quite a significant uh, future requirement. Indeed, uh, the report I, I raised in Parliament last week suggested that there's a need for a, an additional 500 classrooms across the secondary school estate. I was just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary can recognise that figure or had a, a, a comparable figure and, and, and whether or not future announcements would be reflecting and addressing that point? Um, well, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, the proportion of pupils who are in a poor or bad condition school, described school, um, is 13% of pupils, which is a reduction from 37% when the government came to office. So again, very significant progress has been made there. Now, we need to um, look carefully at the formulation of the school estate in the years to come. I delivered a speech at the Education Buildings Conference a few weeks ago where I encouraged um, interested parties, local authorities, private sector, colleges, universities, uh, to consider um, the, the needs of our future school estate and to move much more to what I would describe as um, campus models where we have a um, greater degree of integrated provision. So if we take, for example, um, a Garnock Academy, which I think is just outside Ms. Maguire's constituency, um, a Garnock Academy is a 2 to 18 campus. And uh, it essentially blends together early learning and childcare, primary education, secondary education, and increasingly college provision within it. So it actually extends beyond 18. So I think we've got to have um, a fairly um, uh, open discussion about what the, um, the contents of that plan will be, and that will obviously have an effect on some of the questions about school capacity that um, Mr Johnson raises, and we have to look very carefully at how we blend together the estate to meet um, pupil needs uh, in the course of the, the period that lies ahead. So, I mean, just given the figures in the in the budget this year, essentially because of the School for the Future uh, program uh, coming to an end, that means that uh, uh, essentially we're going from a, a budget line that was 23 million last year to, to zero. And if you look at the capital provisions and local government capital, once you take out childcare provision, the capital budget, according to Fraser Avander, is down by 63 million. So that's obviously means that we're, we're left with a, a gap at the very least for this year. Um, given that, 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 that uh, uh, a successor programme hasn't yet been announced, I mean, how quickly will the Cabinet Secretary be seeking to bring a, a successor programme online, and how long will that gap between programmes likely to be? 
I, I said that I'd be bringing forward a programme in 2018, uh, so I'll be um, uh, setting out further details to Parliament in due course. But um, Mr Johnson misses my point about what I've said in relation to the investment that's required and the thinking that has to go into the development of uh, our school, or what I would call our education estate, uh, as opposed to just our school estate, because the investment that's been made in early learning and childcare has a part to play in how we ensure our, uh, our estate meets all of the requirements that we place, uh, that we place upon it. So we will bring forward in 2018 that programme, but we should also recognise the colossal achievement that's been made in getting to the position where 86% um, of schools are in good or satisfactory condition, which is a significant uh, transformation of the school estate, given what the government inherited in 2007. Thank you very much. Richard, uh, a couple a brief questions. Question. Just in relation to the school estate, many rural, rural local authorities clearly have to maintain a lot of rural schools, and quite rightly the Scottish Government put in place some hurdles that have to be overcome before a rural school is closed. But nevertheless, that does leave a financial burden on many rural local authorities. I just wonder if the Cabinet Secretary felt, because of the hurdles put in place by the, the Government, whether there's enough account taken of the additional cost of maintaining rural schools in terms of the budget? Well, as, as Mr Lockhead will know, the, the, the distribution formula for local government takes into account issues of rurality and um, the particular and distinctive provision that's, um, that has to be put in place to, to service uh, those communities. And these factors are reflected in the local government settlement. OK. Thank you. Uh, Liz? And yeah, then we'll finish with just one it. question, Cabinet Secretary, on the uh, university uh, sector. Um, so Peter Scott said some very interesting things in his widening access report, one of which was that uh, when it comes to widening access, he was anxious that uh, the financing of that didn't squeeze out uh, other <coughs> students um, who obviously had uh, ability to get to university as well. Do you uh, believe that should there be uh, savings made uh, as a result of Brexit? Uh, in the sector, do you believe that that money should be channelled back into the sector to make these provisions available? The concept of savings from Brexit, <laughs> I can think of actually a lovely saving I'd like to have from Brexit, and that's to be saved from Brexit, uh, which would be nice. I don't disagree. But, but um, uh, obviously, uh, he's, I, I'm, he's making a very serious point. He is. I know, and I'm, I'm, please forgive me. I'm, I'm, uh, the flippancy has got the better of me, but uh, on this rare occasion, but the, uh, there is a serious point here, and obviously, it's something that I uh, need to give consideration to in due course. There is, um, the, we don't actually know what all the arrangements will be for a transitional period and for a, an aftermath period, if I can call it that. So I, I, I'm very alert to the, the issue, but I can't at this stage uh, give a definitive position on what future funding arrangements will be, will be like, but I, I'm very happy to, well, I'm actively considering it with, uh, with the sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Julia. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions around um, higher and further education first and then someone's skills. Sorry. Um, so if I, I deal with the higher and further education first, how has the independent review of student support, um, the recommendations that have been addressed by the budget, particularly, and I'm particularly interested in the recommendations around mental health support for students? We, well, obviously, we've put in place what I consider to be very strong settlements for both the higher and further education communities as a consequence of the budget. And I'm very pleased with the resources that we've been able to invest in both the higher and further education sectors with real terms increases for both the higher and further education sectors. In relation to the uh, questions around mental health, I think they are, um, these are very important questions. They are at the core of the uh, well-being of students and the sustainability of education for many students because of the significance of the issues involved. So the strength of the settlement is, in my view, um, an important investment in the sector, which I would like to see reflected by the sector. And obviously, our um, our um, a guidance to the sector uh, will reflect those points that are raised by the independent review in relation to mental health. 
In relation to the recommendations of the independent review, we have put in place um, an initial investment to, uh, to begin to address some of these questions, but there is a, quite a complicated interaction of issues that we need to look at, particularly in relation to the benefits uh, system that we have to consider as part of understanding the implementation of the um, the independent review, so we'll, we'll need to take some. We'll need some time to to to, to, to come to conclusions on those points. Uh, around student debt, the, you've made recommendations around. Sorry, you've you've the, the budget's taken into account repayment of student loans. How how is that going to impact on um, graduates? Obviously, we've um, we've given a commitment to raise the um, threshold for repayment to twenty two thousand pounds. We're actively. Um, taking forward uh, steps to make that possible and practical, and obviously that will uh, provide some assistance to uh, to graduates at that stage. Yeah. Um, moving on to skills and training, I've, I'm noticing the budget. We've got the modern apprenticeships um, going to be increasing. Um, one of the things that I've discovered in some of the work I've done in the Economy Committee, we've been doing some focus groups, is that quite a lot of older people don't really appreciate that modern apprenticeships are not just for young people. Um, and there's an opportunity there to, to provide people with a, a second chance at another career. And I don't think that message is getting out there to people already in the workforce. What's the government doing to address that? It, we certainly, well, I think there is a, there's a general issue here which is about the reskilling of our population to create the working population that we will, we will require in the years to come. Um, I heard a chilling statistic the other week there that there are 280,000 working people in the Highlands and Islands. And given the normal expectations of demography, we will f have to find 80,000 new employees to replace those who will be leaving the labour market through retirement, etc. That is a colossal undertaking, uh, and which is part of why I am so concerned about the implications of Brexit and whatever happens on free movement of individuals, because that's actually helped us significantly in the last few years. So um, the point that Julie Martin makes is a good one and an important one that we have to make sure that there is a wider understanding of the opportunities that exist for individuals to reskill and to retrain, and we need to pursue that. Yeah, and um, yeah, just the ten million that's been given to the flexible workforce development fund um, is that part and parcel of what I've just been talking about? Is that going to be used to to get people moving into different areas of work that maybe there's a more of a, a future for? The Flexible Workforce Fund is essentially targeted at people who are in work trying to redevelop and redeploy their, uh, redevelop their skills, uh, so there is opportunity in that respect. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and, okay, that takes us to the end of this session. Can I thank you very much for your attendance and take this opportunity to thank the Cabinet Secretary, his officials and all those who have appeared before the committee this year for the time and evidence. We wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Uh, that brings us to the public end of the meeting. Uh, the end of the public part of the meeting. I will now suspend and wait for the gallery to clear.